Hello everyone, reporting today for First Updates Now, I'm Am Haas, and with me here is Team 21232, no team from Herndon, Virginia. They recently competed at the Chesapeake Championship, where they were where they made the eliminations, and they will be soon competing at the Alabama State Championship, looking for one of those tickets to the Houston World Championship. This team is just absolutely fantastic. They have so much depth in their hardware, software, overall game strategy, and just everything. And I'm so excited to learn about all that they have to offer and more coming up on First Update Sound. This video on First Update Sound is made possible by viewers like you and also the following sponsors. SOLIDWORKS is free for FIRST teams. Over 80% of U.S. engineering schools and 370,000 plus companies use SOLIDWORKS to design great products. SOLIDWORKS can help you design a great robot on desktop or on the cloud. Go to SOLIDWORKS.com FIRST to register your team. Check out our all-new FTC content coming to Fund's YouTube, including new hosts from the FTC community. We'll have resource guides, top 10 moments, behind-the-bots interviews, and walkthroughs to help your FTC team improve at YouTube.com slash FIRSTUPDATES now. All right, guys, let's get started with your drivetrain. You guys have a very compact drivetrain, uh, and I'm sure there's just a lot going on there. So walk me through it, and we can jump into the hardware and software separately. Yeah, so first, uh, kind of what you said, our drivetrain is kind of compact. So this is actually our second robot this year. So our first one was around, I want to say, 14 by 14. Uh, and we thought that, or at least Neil thought when we were driving, that we were hitting way too many things and it was just a little bit cumbersome for us. So we decided to go and reduce it even further to a 13 by 13. Uh, and so what we have on our drivetrain too was on our first robot, we were running one to one pulleys, uh, standard 312 go build RPM motors. Uh, and we have, we just wanted more speed, especially for getting those circuits and just being all over the field. Um, so we have on our uh, on our drivetrain mo on our motors, we have 24 tooth pulleys, and our wheels are custom 3D printed um, 18 tooth pulleys. So it's around 400 RPM now. Uh, and aside from that, um, we really just have standard three wheel odometry, open auto, and it's all um, just sprung. Sure. So yeah, that's. Yeah, that's about it for our drivetrain. Yeah, and so uh, for your plates, like where did you get your outer plates cut from? Uh, was that something you did in-house or you, like you used some sort of machining service? Uh, and like would yeah. you recommend that for teams? Yeah, so um, one thing, or uh, at least how we produce our plates, we don't have um, CNC's here or laser cutters. Um, so what we primarily use uh, if we want to go for custom parts um, besides 3D printing is Send Cut Send. Um, we, it's pretty standard and we I would recommend it to other teams that are looking to try to uh, get custom parts, whether it's aluminum, delrin, or polycarb, especially if they don't have the capabilities to manufacture those parts. Sure. And so from a software standpoint, walk me through like your drivetrain, path planning, path following, all of that stuff in autonomous. Um, and then we can talk about like any teleop automations or enhancements that you guys have. Yeah. So um, I have my own library that I've been developing for around a year now, Koalalib, which is open sourced and published on GitHub. And Koalalib has essentially a solution for every FTC software problem. So as you said, path planning, we use Hermite spline interpolation to generate paths, which is basically a method of um, defining a path start and end uh, positions and derivatives, and then getting a, a spline path from that. To follow these paths, we use guiding vector field based path following, which is essentially projecting our posi the position of the robot onto these spline-based paths, and then calculating the uh, tangent and normal vectors and mixing them to provide us with a velocity vector. Uh, we also have odometry solutions, so three-wheel and two-wheel in Koalalib. And then um, for driver enhancements with our drivetrain, we have cubic uh, joystick scaling on our joysticks, which essentially allows us to have really like fine control over lower values on the joysticks. But at higher values, we can ramp up really fast and just full send down the field to circuit. Sure. And so, uh, you know, what challenges did you face this season, like with, with all this? I mean, it sounds, it is pretty advanced stuff. And so was it just, you got it right the first time or was there like a lot of troubleshooting and testing that you had to go through? And what did that process look like? And how would you uh, recommend teams to get through that faster and reach that final solution? Yeah, so um, I guess one of the things that we kind of highlight is uh, prototyping. So, uh, and I guess iteration too. So uh, again, this is our second robot of the year. So our first one, um, we knew that we wanted to have a virtual four bar pass through design. Um, so we actually went for a kind of larger virtual four bar. Uh, it was mounted at the top here, it was around 400 millimeters long. 
And from there, we would iterate through things like our claw. Uh, I think we went through at least like three or four claw designs, um, like, well, designs aside from like actually prototyping different things for each design. Uh, and additionally, like, we would just kind of note, hey, this is what we want to do for the next iteration. Uh, and this is what we like, like to keep. This is what we want to fix. And so, uh, again, so we found with the 400 millimeter vertical foregrab, for example, it was kind of big. And if we were picking some, like a cone close to the wall and we, we swung the virtual four bar, it would hit the wall and it just wasn't a great time as well as um, it just being so large, it required a lot of torque. Um, so we kind of scaled it down to around 200 millimeter uh, virtual, well, adjustable virtual four bar. Um, but aside from just learning from our mistakes like that, we also um, get things that we kind of uh, want to keep. So our first one was uh, an adjustable virtual four bar so we could have tilt on a robot. Um, that means we can pick up the cone um, so it's like completely parallel to the ground. And uh, when we're depositing, we can um, tilt the cone so it makes it a lot easier for the driver. And we found that that feature was nice. And so again, we would bring it into this uh, iteration as well, as well as just like working through other things, seeing what other teams have done. Um, this, uh, for example, our, cone al or our pole aligner, it's something we just added and we're still experimenting with, especially after seeing a lot of team successes. So I'd say just looking at what other teams do, um, as well as just iterating and prototyping is probably a key factor. Yeah, sure. And so, you know, you mentioned your virtual four bar. So let's just jump right into that. How are you powering it right now? Um, and, you know, what were some of like the key challenges you had with it that you think it would really help for other teams to know? Yeah, so um, our virtual four bar right now, uh, actually, let me lift it up. It's powered by these two Axon Maxes, and it's actually just geared to this virtual four bar. Uh, and you can see inside, but well, we have like um, two other servos. So the top one is the thing we just added with the pole liner. But at the bottom, we have our kind of tilt that we have. Uh, and basically what this is, is on a normal virtual four bar. Um, this is going to be almost like completely static most of the time, uh, this pulley. But what we did is we mounted a servo here. And uh, from here, we can kind of just, well, if we rotate the servo, we can kind of give us the tilt I was talking about earlier, uh, as well as just uh, I'd say, at least for this year, um, our, our arm had almost no tolerance, especially because we designed most of this in a week. Um, so it was things like grabbing a cone, would it be able to fit through this hole? And the answer was no on our first design. Um, so actually, you can kind of see it here. Uh, you can see the black aluminum that we painted, and then the outer plate that we mounted. Uh, it was just a standard aluminum pattern plate, but just to extend it so we it, the cone can fit through here as well as just other things like um, uh, just tolerances, things like, uh, well, actually, because our arm is actually really small, we can't just run a standard uh, chain on the outside. Uh, and we can't run a chain on the inside either because um, the cone is going to hit it. Uh, so what we actually had to do, and this was kind of, uh, well, we had to actually go through CAD in order to make this happen. But what we had to kind of run a belt through here to the axle for the uh, tilt. And then from the axle, we had to mount a little bit on the inside. And then another axle, or the axle would be connected to this one uh, on the outside, just so we could kind of get uh, benefits from a virtual four bar while still fitting within the dimensions. I'd say in the future, uh, I mean, just make sure you have all the tolerances right. Uh, it's going to save you a lot of time. But Yeah. And so one thing that I'm really interested in with your guys' virtual four bar is you said you have like that active uh v4b so and i see that you guys deposit your cones at an angle so when determining that angle obviously was something that you could play around with and adjust so how did you figure out that optimal angle um and you know what is it if you you know if the number is of any significance like what is it yeah so we originally had this idea of the um angle deposit at the beginning of the season when we were just you know tossing around cones just prototyping you know, how exactly should we deposit uh, cones on the poles? So when we first had our uh, V1 robot, what I initially did to test the angles was just run um, FTC dashboard, which is a open source uh, library that's used for uh, deploying, um, you know, like config variables onto a robot in quick iterations. So using FTC dashboard, I could adjust this, uh, this angle this angle of the claw right here in real time. And we re we eventually found something that's around, I think, 60 degrees. Yeah. So using this uh, angle, it acts almost like a cone, like guider, when we ram into the pole. So when, when we uh, go into the pole, 
we can have this like error, like this tolerance, which is around the radius of the cone. And any like if the uh, pole is in that somewhat like circle base of the cone, then we can just release the cone and it'll just slide onto the fold right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that's really impressive. Thank you. And so from a software standpoint on your arm, uh, what what are like some key algorithms you think that really separate your arm control from other teams um, and how have they worked out for you? Yeah, so one thing that we do, which is a safety precaution with our arm, is that we have these um, analog encoders on the axons that we wired up to our control hub, and we use them to check the angle of the arm and make sure that our claw is in a safe position to always uh, open or close. So a problem that we had um, a couple of weeks ago was that whenever our claw was depositing outside, since our sequences are very fast, sometimes our claw would stay open just for like i don't know like 0 0.01 seconds and then this would this claw would get caught in the arm so we have pre uh, safety precautions that make sure that the arm will never move without the claw actually being fully closed and the claw will never open without the uh arm being either in the intaking position or the outtaking position on top of that we also motion profile our servos um just to make sure that we have an additional constraint on our acceleration and velocity yeah, that, that makes a ton of sense. And so, you know, talking about your lift now, I believe you guys have, I know at one point in the season, you guys ran a four motor lift. I'm not sure how many you're running at this very instant, but give us an overview of your lift, you know, how it's strung or belted um, and how it's changed throughout the season. Yeah, so for sure. So uh, like I said, um, we this is our second row. So on our version one, we ran a three motor lift. Uh, it was uh, same, these motors were and still are 1150 RPM. Uh, and so basically, I guess how we started from there was we ran three motors and we had one on our arm. Um, and what we did there was we actually first used string and well, we found that after like a full day, uh, we weren't able to tension. Um, and so we decided just that day, hey, let's just look into belts. Uh, our sister team is running it too. Um, and so, yeah, we've swapped to belts since then. Um, and basically, I guess how our belt system kind of works um, well, we use uh, tensioners over here. And so our initial tensioners, what they would do is the two belts would overlay each other and would clamp down on each other. Uh, and that would kind of help keep our uh, belts uh, in place. But we found that that was number one, hard to tension. And number two, um, it was just not great, especially because the 3D prints we were using tended to bend. Um, so we went for this solution. Uh, and basically what it is, is there's like kind of a loop. And what these what it does is the teeth of the belt hook onto each other inside kind of keep it clamped together. And once we have around the right tension, we have a long screw running through here, as well as a nut inside here. Uh, and what we do is we just screw in the thing to adjust it up or down to get the right amount of tension, uh, as well as that. But um, so our four motor lift, uh, so we swapped to a four motor lift for this robot. And basically what it is, is on two sides, we have uh, motors and they're geared together. Uh, and inside, uh, we run a chain, uh, which runs inside the robot. And inside, these two motors are mechanically linked to these two, two motors, just so everything's just, well, mechanically linked. And so it makes programming easier, and it's just a very nice failsafe to have. Um, and from there, we have the gears uh, just connect to a pulley, and yeah, well, two pulleys, and they just run through and power the rest of our lift. So yeah, one, one question I have with four motors is uh, about like power and current draw. Like, have you guys had any issues uh, with that? And you know, how have you dealt with that if you have? or? If you haven't, why have you not had any issues with that? Yeah. So one thing about our lift is that um, in our first competition with this robot, I believe at Laurel, Maryland, we had a lot of uh, tension and friction in our belts, which caused our lift to have a like require a lot of torque to move up and down. And at this point, we had to drop one of our motors solely because it was causing our robot to brown out. Um, now, after we fix that belt tension problem or the belt friction problem, we don't really have that many power issues. And we also kind of circumvent this issue of like browning out that could happen with this four motor lift by making sure that, you know, we aren't like fully blasting all the motors, all the drive motors, all the lift motors at the exact same time. And it, I mean, it works out for us. Our lift is like pretty fast, I think 0.4 is, uh, seconds for full extension. And in our motion profile config, we have around 270 seconds or 270 inches per second squared for acceleration and velocity or 270 seconds 
270 inches per second for velocity too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, got it. And so, you know, before we end the interview, I want to look forward a little bit for your future competitions. You guys did pretty well at Chesapeake, you know, had some really high scores, very smooth driving. And so for the Alabama State Championship, what do you need to make happen to ensure you can get that winning alliance uh, captain spot that's needed to get to the Houston World Championship? Yeah, so for sure. So uh, one thing that we've been doing is we've been looking back at our past videos, seeing where we can optimize not only drive practice wise, but how we can fix it mechanically. Uh, you can see here, uh, we've already added a polo liner, just looking at what other teams have done too. Uh, so the polo liner, would, we saw our sister team running it, and I think it worked very well for them in teleop. And we decided, hey, this is like a great idea, as well as um, just our intaking speed. Uh, we noticed that we were a little bit slow, so we can fix that with drive practice, but we can also fix that by maybe potentially ramming the wall with our Kona liner, which is on the front here. Um, and just, uh, yeah, things like that, trying to find spots where we're lacking compared to other teams and just trying to buff it up. Yeah, on the software side of things, we're also going to optimize all of our sequences for both Teleop and Autonomous before Alabama States. So one thing is that um, I'm the solo driver for the team, Jonathan does all the human player uh, cone placements. So this requires a lot of automation on our, on my end. And one thing is that um, our robot basically functions on one button. So I press one button and the robot goes through its entire intake and deposit sequences. And one thing that we're planning on optimizing for Alabama States is all of our times in between waiting for the cone to uh, get gripped by the claw, waiting for it to deposit, stuff like that. So I can just show a example of our robot functioning mm -hmm. with this one button teleop sequence. So right here, all I have to press is the right trigger, and then we go through our entire intake sequence. This, and then uh, say we want to deposit, I don't know, on the high pole. So all of these um, small wait times in between our subsystem motions is something that we're really planning to hone in and identify for Alabama states. Sure. Yeah, that, that sounds like a fantastic plan. And, you know, you guys have proven that you know what it takes to get those high scores. And now it's just about getting that consistency uh, that's needed to rank very high in qualifications. So, no team, thank you very much for this interview. I think teams have a lot to learn from you guys from hardware, software, just overall everything that it takes to be a very high performing FTC team. So, thank you so much. Reporting for First Updates Now, I'm Abhas. This video on First Updates Now is made possible by viewers like you and also the following sponsors. SOLIDWORKS is free for first teams. Over 80% of U.S. engineering schools and 370,000 plus companies use SOLIDWORKS to design great products. SOLIDWORKS can help you design a great robot on desktop or on the cloud. Go to SOLIDWORKS.com first to register your team. Check out our all new FTC content coming to Fund's YouTube including new hosts from the FTC community. We'll have resource guides, top 10 moments, behind the bots interviews, and walkthroughs to help your FTC team improve at youtube.com slash first updates now. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay up to date on our new videos. Keep the conversation going and provide your input to our content. Watch our live shows at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Join our Discord at discord.gg forward slash first updates now. And check out Fun FTC on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And First Updates Now on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter.